Hello everyone, we're going to be talking today about the Lament Bass. It's a musical device that shows up in a lot of music from around the beginning of the 17th century or a little bit earlier. We don't know when it originated exactly or who started it, but it became popular very quickly and has remained popular ever since, as we will talk about in this video. So the Lament bass, so-called, is in its basic form, it's an ostinato, which means that it's a figure that repeats. And generally it's a bass ostinato, so it repeats in the bass line. And the basic form is that is that of a descending stepwise fourth. So it's a tetrachord. We talked about that earlier in the semester. That means tetrachord, that means it's a combination of four notes. And in this case, it's a four note scale that descends. And typically the scale degrees are Do, Te, Le, Sol. So you've all heard this before. I'm going to play one of many examples. This is Ray Charles's Hit the Road Jack. Okay, so that's the lament bass in action. It's repeating and it's that descending tetrachord um, in the bass. So it's very effective and we're gonna hear many different examples of it in this video. So a little bit more about what it is. The, this particular ostinato was used, as I said, in the 17th century. And it was used in particular to convey the idea of an intense or overwhelming emotion like love or lament. The repetitive looping of the ostinato is really a big part of that. It conjures the sense that one is trapped or caught up in this emotion, like you can't escape it. And the brilliance of this device is that instruments could communicate to the audience what emotion to feel without needing words to do so. Now that's a really big deal because we're in this time period where instrumental music is coming into its own as its own art form without the dependence on vocal music. But the challenge there is that instrumental music, since it does not have words, what does it mean? And there's a lot of debate about that. And one of the ways that composers devise to give music without words meaning is to come up with instrumental or musical figures that everyone knew what those figures meant. And this is a good example where with this lament bass, as soon as you hear it, you know that the emotion you're about to experience um, is some kind of lament or overwhelming intense emotion. Again, whether love or mourning or something along those lines. So it's very effective um, and partly for that reason it was used uh, over and over again. So we're going to look at a few examples. And one of the questions is, why does it work so well on a word painting level, um, especially in the 17th century? So one of the reasons is that already uh, by around 1600 or so, uh, the idea of using descending melodic lines to convey a mournful emotion was well known, was very familiar to audiences at that point. And we're, I'm going to play an example that we talked about before spring break. This is Mila Rugre, the Josquin, or we think possibly Josquin, but, but there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, and so, but you're going to hear that the melodic lines are pretty much all descending, including you get a number of descending stepwise fourth figures. And so, even though these aren't in the bass line like they will be later on, um, that the idea of using this figure to convey a sad, uh, affect is very much present already around 
So if you're listening, you can hear that there are different versions of a falling fourth, different combinations of half steps and whole steps. The one that we listened to right at where I stopped, uh, where you have in the soprano line, in the contra line, A, G, F, E, that is your Do, Te, Le, Sol basic tetrachord. But before that, we had other combinations of, again, half steps and whole steps. So um, looking at another example, we're going to fast forward now to another piece we talked about before spring break, and that is John Dowland's Flow My Tears. And if you recall, the very opening motive is a descending tetrachord, that tear motive that you hear right in the, in the vocal line with the words Flow My Tears. And the, that descending fourth shows up in all kinds of ways throughout the piece. So it really permeates the entire uh, music. And so, and again, it's a very effective use of that motive, but it's not happening in the bass line like we will see uh, in later music so frequently. So here's just the beginning of John Dowland's Flow My Tears. So even when the music is not going down, it's still, by fourth, it's still going down pretty predominantly. So we're going to fast forward again now to Claudio Monteverdi's Lamento della Ninfa. This is the Lament of the Nymph in, in 1638. So if, if you think about your timeline, uh, he composes Orfeo in 1607. So this is 31 years after his first great operatic masterpiece, but he's still composing madrigals. But what you find in these later madrigals is there are a lot more operatic elements to them. And there's really some really interesting innovations that he, that he is coming up with even in these later years. So this is a very famous um, madrigal and it's operatic in the sense that there is a solo singer that is accompanied by uh, an instrumental line and in this case a kind of a male chorus so you have the the nymph portrayed by the um, soprano singing and then you have sort of a, a call and response element to this to this uh, music. So I'm not going to play the whole thing. It's over four minutes long and for those entire four minutes the lament bass is repeating over and over again and what you hear is that the vocal lines are pushing and pulling against that that bass line creating uh, always kind of new types of dissonances. So one of the tricky challenges for composers when they are using this bass line is because it is so repetitive how do you how do you keep it fresh how do you keep it moving um, so that it just doesn't become the same thing over and over again and that th that tension between repetition and and um, dynamic variety is a big part of the expressive power of this type of uh, ground bass ostinato aria here we go. This is the Monteverdi's Lamento della Ninfa.
Okay, so you get the idea. And again, so the, just the sheer length of this piece is a big part of the 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 way it is portraying an overwhelming sense of inescapable emotional state. So we're going to move ahead now to Barbara Strozzi. And uh, so this is in your anthology. Uh, and so this piece is a solo cantata, which means that it contains a number of different sections and different styles. It's kind of like a mini opera is one way to, to think of it for, for one singer. So I'm going to talk more about this piece in a different video. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead now to later in, in the piece. Um, we have uh, at the end of the piece, before it goes back to the beginning, we have a section that is based on the lament bass. And in this particular performance, it begins with just an instrumental introduction. And for an audience, as soon as you hear that lament bass, again, you know what the emotion is going to be. So we're going to listen to that, and then and then I'll, then I'll play a bit of the vocal uh, vocal line above that. So you hear how the voice is interacting with the lament bass. So just a few things about that. Uh, one of the tricky things that a composer has to work out is if they are not going to end the piece with that ostinato, they have to figure ha out how to get out of it. And I'm going to just, re if we look at the score here, uh, we have the lament bass, that descending tetrachord, but then we have this kind of new material after that, a kind of like uh, almost like a little coda or tag. And that's the way that Strozzi gets out of it. And for me, uh, and I think this is not coincidental, when you get out of that ostinato, it's almost like a breath of fresh air, like the light has come through the clouds and y it's like escaping from that, that kind of d darker emotional state. So it's very effective that, that the sheer amount of repetition and then the relief from that repetition um, kind of brings an emotional reward to it that I think um, is a big part of the effectiveness of this lament base. So, next piece. Now, here's a very famous example. This is Henry Purcell's Dido's Lament from his one-act opera, Dido and Aeneas. And so what's different about this particular version of, of the lament base is that Purcell has chromaticized the falling tetrachord. So instead of do, te, le, sol, we have all the chromatic notes in between that. And the reason that he does that is to, by adding chromaticism, he intensifies the emotion of this ground bass, this lament bass figure. Um, another thing that he does is, is he adds a little tag to the end of the figure so that um, 
and that is part of how he adds variety. It's also part of how he gets out of the the rep repetition at the very end. So one of the things to listen for, and we heard this in Monteverdi's Lament, uh, is that you have this vocal line that is constantly pushing and pulling against the this repetitive bass line. Sometimes the vocal line lines up with the bass line. Sometimes it's kind of out of phase with the bass line and it's always creating new dissonances. And it's almost like uh, the character, Dido in this case, is trying to escape from that bass line. She is feeling caught by it and is just really trying to wrestle free from it and ultimately she can't. So if you know the story, um, this is her lament that she sings. Aeneas has abandoned her and uh, and as so happens often in opera, her response to that is to take her own life. So this is her lament saying, please remember me after I'm gone, is the the very crude gist of, of the text. So listen for that lament bass and it's in its chromatic version here. I just want to point out something here. The vocal line ends here, but then the instruments continue. And we see this more and more. It's again a, a symptom of instrumental music coming into its own. So here we have the orchestra essentially having the last word and conveying its 
sense of emotion in its own way. It adds even more chromaticism than we've had during the vocal line to wrap up this aria. Here we go. Okay, so now we've talked about two pieces that, that are in the anthology. We're going to jump way ahead now to show you some examples of how this lament, lament bass shows up in modern music. So I'm going to show you two examples from film scores, and then, then we will listen to two examples from popular music of the very recent past. So the first film example is going to be from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. This is, spoiler alert, shows you the funeral for Dumbledore after he has been killed. And uh, so, as happens very often in this particular type of scene, the lament bass is used in the soundtrack to convey the same kind of emotion and the same idea of being trapped in that emotion that we have seen all the way back to the 17th century. Just to call back to something I said earlier, in the scene at the very end there, when that repetitive ostinato breaks off and we get something new, then again you get that feeling of light kind of coming through the clouds. And in the scene you literally get light coming through the clouds at that moment. So it's an effective way of conveying um, a sense of being caught in emotion and then escaping from that 
from that emotion. So an, another example of a funeral scene uh, is from Thor The Dark World. Not one of the better Marvel movies, but hey, that's okay. Um, this is, we're using this for the musical example. So um, uh, this is from the scene where Thor's mother is killed and it's her funeral. And so again, you hear that lament bass in the soundtrack um, and I think it's pretty evident. So there you have it, the Lament Base in Thor the, the Dark World. So one of the things that has been said about the 17th century is that the, the composers of that period really gave a, the gift of how to convey emotion through musical language. And I'd say that there's a lot of truth to that. And, and so one of the things that you're seeing in these film scores is that because that language of emotion is so effective you see these film composers going back to a at a 17th century musical device and and using it for these poignant moments in, in the soundtrack so a couple new examples from now from popular music uh, this one is from muses mk ultra and this is from about halfway through the song uh, that the volume might be a little loud so just forewarning but you hear a, a, a new variation on the same idea uh, of the descending, in this case, chromatic tetrachord. So a couple things about this, and just to tie it back in with the 17th century, so word painting is something that doesn't only happen in madrigals. We're seeing it very blatantly here. So you have the words, now we're fallen, accompanied by a falling bass line. And so in the next example, we're also going to see uh, words like down um, and the whole idea of falling accompanying that same type of musical device. So very blatant word painting here. Um, also at the last lyrics, we are losing control. I think that is very much in tune with the way this type of lament bass is used because the fact that you are feeling caught up in that emotion is in a sense a type of losing control. You're, you're, you're unable to get out of it. And uh, so, so the lyrics very much fit the musical device that is being used here. So our next popular music example is from Radiohead's Paranoid Android. This is again a long section from uh, a little past midway through the song, which uh, if you know the song um, has a lot to it. And uh, so this is a more 
varied version of the lament based idea than we've seen up to this point but you can still see the connections i think you have the descending lines um, in in many cases they are descending force and, and they are constantly descending i think the lyrics um, match up with the general sentiment that we've come to expect for this type of musical device and it the whole thing can raise you a sense of being kind of caught up in this uh, state and trying to escape from it. So uh, let's, we're going to listen now. And in two measures, they are out of it and into new material. So, again, they fa found a way to escape this uh, emotional state that goes on for a fairly big chunk of the song. So, so we're going to end with uh, a little bit closer to where we started. This is Monteverdo's Lament Lamento de la Ninfa, but this is Anna Brun's 2011 cover of the song. So this is her singing. Uh, the lyrics that she has translated to English, and she's just accompanying herself on guitar. Uh, I think it's lovely, and uh, it just shows you how this d device can be effective in a whole variety of mediums and genres. And uh, I mean, there's there are many reasons why it has stuck around for so long. So enjoy, and the video will end with this recording. Okay, so this one is, um, I would call it a cover, but it's a, a cover of a song from the 1600s written by Claudia Monteverdi, mm -hmm. and it's a, what, they would, what they call a lament, Lamento della Ninfa, mm -hmm. and I've done a, a translation into English, mm -hmm. so this is a cover song, <laughs> Baroque. Ba rock and roll covers. It will not hurt me It will not 
so proud standing in this light. The light I spread on him. If I would leave him in the shadows, would he come back? As bright, her kisses as light, as feathers, as feathers on your skin. Oh, love the value of my true heart in your hand lasts longer than her kiss ever can. Is true love like my heart. Please do not speak, my love. You know this all so well. Just love me, love me. Speak.